Okay, praise the Lord. Well, have you ever had one of those days when nothing seems to go right? All right, well, let me tell you this story about Chippy the parakeet who never saw what was coming. One second, he's peacefully perched up in his cage, and the next second, he's sucked in, he's washed up, and he's blown over. The problems began when Chippy's owner decided that she was going to clean out his cage. So she takes the vacuum cleaner, takes off the attachment, and puts it in the va in, into the cage. And then as she's doing this, the phone rings, so she reaches with the other hand to answer the phone, and <sniffs> Chippy is sucked into the vacuum cleaner. This is a true story, all right? And so... She's just in shock, and she thinks, okay, she turns off the, she puts the phone down, she turns off the vacuum cleaner, she rips open the bag, and there's, there's Chippy in shock. And, uh, so she, and she notices he's covered in dirt and dust, so she takes him over to the faucet, turns on the water, she gives him a bath, and then she knows, notices he's shivering, and so she pulls out her hair blower and just blasts him with hot air. A few days after the trauma, the reporter who initially wrote about this story contacted the owner to see how Chippy was doing. She said, well, Chippy doesn't sing anymore. He just sits and stares. <laughs> well, it's not hard to see why. I mean, sucked in, washed up, blown over. That's enough to steal the, the song in the heart from, from anybody. So can you relate this morning? One minute, you're seated in familiar territory, you're enjoying the, the sunshine, the blue skies, and then all of a sudden, you're handed the pink slip. You're, they're downsizing, you experience rejection, financial disaster, the doctor's report is not good, uh, a person you know is tragically killed, a, a child comes home and, and, and says they're, they're leaving or, or they're gay. It's like, wow, life now, all of a sudden, is upside down and you're in the midst of the storm. Well, I know a few things about storms because I've experienced them myself, storms of life. It was April 28th, 1979. Now, that may seem like a long time ago to you, but to Donna and I, it's not very long ago, right? Right. We look, we're well preserved. Anyway. Um, I woke to what I thought was just another day. It was a sunny day. We were living up in the Ottawa Valley in a town called uh, Pembroke, just about 100 kilometers. Oh, somebody knows where that is. <laughs> Good for you. 100 kilometers north of Ottawa. And um, it was a beautiful spring day. The valley had long winters, but it was spring. The birds were chirping. The trees were budding. And uh, it was sunny. And I was going to work. Well, that night, my husband had planned a special dinner in order uh, to celebrate my birthday that had taken place earlier and that week. And when I came home, the good china was on the table, the candles were lit, and supper was ready. And we began to eat and to share. He was going to... Um, unload. He was going to begin to share what was happening. Throughout that winter, he was making plans to go back to school, leave the ministry. We were in full-time ministry. He, he just was making all these plans without really asking what I thought or, or getting any feedback from me. And halfway through the dinner, he says, Anna, I'm tired of a double life. I'm gay and I'm coming out of my closet. Well, I sat there across the table, pinching myself, wondering if this was real, if it was true. Could this really be happening to me? Was I watching a TV program? And suddenly I realized, no, this pinching hurts. And so it's actually happening to me. This is reality. I had a lot of questions. And the major one was, God, where are you? Like, do you know that this is happening to me? I mean, I grew up in a Christian home. I dedicated my life to him. I I'd come to Christ at an early age and always sought to do his will. And now this storm, like, why me? Why not somebody else? But why me? The waves were too high. And I kept telling him, I felt like I, I feel like I'm going to drown God. I was being crushed by the weight of this load. Well, we split up three months later as he could not promise me faithfulness and neither would he go for counseling. And I returned home to Montreal and he went down to Ottawa to continue education. So what did I learn in the midst of the storm? 
Turn with me to Mark chapter 6. Those of you who have your Bibles, those of you who have phones, find it. Mark chapter 6, verse 45 to 51. And verse 45 says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went into the hills to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against him. them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and they were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down and they were completely amazed. Well, it was the end of the day and Jesus is exhausted both physically and mentally. He had learned earlier that day that his cousin John had died. He had been beheaded, and he was trying to process his emotions. And as he tried to get away to the other side of the lake, the crowds just followed him. And as a result, he, he, he continued to minister, and he also fed the 5,000 men and the plus women and the children that day. Well, it's no wonder that he's tired. I mean, I think we'd be tired if we fed 5,000 men plus women and children, right? Yeah. And so he says to his disciples, get into the boat and cross over to the other side. I'll see you there. And he goes up into the hills to pray. Verse 45 says, he made his disciples get into the boat. He ordered them to go ahead. He put his disciples in the boat and stays to pray. And the disciples, they don't object. At least Mark doesn't say they did. They obeyed. He, they did what he had asked them to do. In John 6, John tells the same story. It says in verse 17, By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. They had rowed three or three and a half miles. Boy, they didn't get very far. You see, a storm uh, just came upon them on the, on the sea as they were rowing out. And all they were experiencing were huge waves and the ride of their lives as they tried to conquer this storm. So the first thing I learned about storms of life is that, one, storms are in the plan of Jesus. The disciples obeyed Jesus by getting into the boat. He told them to go on ahead. He knew the storm was coming, and yet he still tells them to go on ahead. And what was the result? They end up in this fierce storm, and they rode all night and didn't get anywhere. They were just able to stay afloat. So firstly, storms come to everyone. They are a part of life. James 1, 2 says, when you face trials, not if you face trials. Count on it. You will face trials in your life. You will experience storms. They're inevitable. And Jesus in John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So you will have trouble. Not only do the storms come to everyone, but storms are also unpredictable. They come suddenly. They come unexpectedly. And thirdly, storms are impartial. They happen to good people. They happen to bad people. They happen to believers. They happen to unbelievers. Matthew 5, 45 says he sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Storm, a storm came to Jonah as he was trying to run away from God's will. And a storm came to these disciples who had obeyed Jesus and were trying to cross the sea. The week before my husband's confession, we were attending a youth rally up in Shawville, Quebec. And throughout that whole service, the Lord kept impressing upon my heart, will you serve me without your husband? 
I thought, wow, that's a strange request. You know, why, why are you asking me this, God? Is, is he going to die? Is he going to backslide? Like, wh what's going to happen? And I, I couldn't figure it out. But at the end of the service, as the speaker called people forward and, and, and the young people went forward in dedication uh, to Christ, I went forward and said, Lord, no matter what happens, whatever the cost, I will serve you because I love you. And I really believe that because I determined that night to serve God no matter what came my way, I believe he came into my boat and he began to steer it right through the storm. You see, he didn't take me out like so often we want to be taken out of a storm, but he left me in it and he continued to steer my boat over to safe land. And that's why I experienced peace. Yes, I was emotionally distraught, but there was an underlying peace that could only come from God. Isaiah 43, 2 and 3 says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Jesus knew the storm was coming in my life, and he didn't prevent it but because of my determination, he was going to be with me through that storm. So even through the storms, even though storms are part of the plan, Jesus is not idle. Verse 46 tells us after leaving them, he went into the hills to pray. What was Jesus doing? Jesus was praying. He was praying for his disciples. He knew of their upcoming struggle, and he had already gone to the Father on their behalf. So verse 48 assures us that Jesus is praying. And then verse 48 continues to say, Jesus is watching. You see, he saw them, it says, out on the lake straining at the oars. So Jesus is praying. Jesus is watching. He's aware of what's going on. And lastly, Jesus waits. He waits. I don't know why he waits, but we have to trust him with this one. It says in verse 48, about the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them. Now, that's about 3 o'clock in the morning. Nine hours, roughly nine hours there were on this raging sea, rowing and rowing and rowing and only getting three miles out. You see, Jesus waits, and he comes at just the right time. When we're ready to give up, he comes. Not our time, but his. I was alone for 10 years. Not always easy as I, I uh, grew up in an Italian home. So family is very, very important. Like family, 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 family. And it's not normal if you don't have family, family. Anyway, and, and there were times when I, the emptiness was so great, and, and I'd say, Lord, you know, I just need to be told that I'm still loved and worthy as, a, as, as somebody to be loved. And, and so I, I just was crying, and, and that night I could hear somebody coming up the stairs in our, in our home, and, and um, our, the bedrooms were upstairs, and my dog's ears went up as, as she heard the same thing, and then I felt a presence in the room, and, and uh, my dog jumped off the bed, and, and I could feel somebody lying beside me, and then all of a sudden I felt these arms wrap themselves around me, and, and this shoulder was there so that I could cry on, and that night the Holy Spirit made his arms real to me. He came to be my comforter. He came to be my strengthener, and he was whispering sweet nothings in my ear, just letting me know that I was still valued as a person, that I still had purpose and meaning. That's how real God can be to you in your situation. Amen. Amen. Deuteronomy 33, 27 says, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And oh, he made those arms real to me many times over. Hebrews 13, 5 says, God has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. And there will be times when you feel like you're all alone, that God just isn't there. And Rick Warren says, to mature your friendship, God will test it with periods of seeming separation. Times when it feels as if he has abandoned or forgotten you. God feels a million miles away. But it's in those times, the dry season in your life, when you think he's not there, he's still there. 
So keep watching for him. Keep trusting him. Because he's always there. He never leaves us. He doesn't leave us stranded in a storm, but he's right there praying. He's watching and waiting for that right moment. So storms are in the plan of Jesus. Secondly, storms are under his control. Jesus comes walking on the water in the midst of the storm, and he calls out to his disciples, take courage. It's I. It is I. Don't be afraid. And I've learned that Jesus comes at just the right time. He's never too early or never too late. My ex-husband died eight years later after contracting um, AIDS. And it's a sad story of a man who, who knew the truth, but set out to do his own thing, ultimately bringing destruction upon himself. And Proverbs 16.25 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the waves of death. Well, the following summer, I was reliving the death of my husband and our marriage and our divorce and, and all that stuff and just mourning and reflecting. And one night as I was sleeping, about three in the morning, I, I felt these words were coming to me. And, and I thought, oh, I should get up and write them. But no, sleep was a lot better. And then all of a sudden, I felt like I was being pushed out of the bed. And I thought, okay. That was the Holy Spirit telling me, no, you need to get up. And, and as I did and, and wrote out those words that were coming, it was like the whole ordeal was over. There was a, a cleansing and a release that was taking place in, in my spirit. And then in the morning when I got up, I thought, oh, this is good. Maybe I should send it into the Pentecostal testimony. And so it appeared in the October issue of 1988. And I tell this story because there's, there's some humor to it. You know, God has a friend of uh, a sense of humor. And um, uh, my friends had always been telling me, oh, Anna, you should put a want ad in the testimony, fine Christian woman looking for a great, handsome young man, you know, and, and list your requirements. And I thought, yeah, 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 right, right, right. But my article did bring me my man. Yep, here's this pastor, and he, he gets the testimony, and he's looking at the, feet, the articles, and, and he notices that two of his classmates have written articles, and, and then he, he sees, oh, I'm going to read Anna's first, and, and he says he, he read it three times, three times, I don't know why, but he read it three times, and then he looked at this tiny, tiny little picture in that corner there, and he, black and white, and he goes, oh, not bad, not bad. Yep. <laughs> so um, he decides to write me a letter. Now, Ron and I were classmates. He was born and raised in Montreal, like Donna and I. Uh, didn't know him until we went to school, college. He had married some from, someone from PEI. They went into ministry in, in Quebec, French churches. And I was in Ontario. And he wasn't aware what had happened in my life. Well, in his life, he had lost his wife earlier that week through a four-year bout of cancer. And he was left with three children, a daughter of nine, a son of seven, and another son of two. And, uh, yeah, looking at this article, he decided, well, I'm going to write her a letter and thank her for her honesty and, and what it meant to me and just tell her a bit about my situation. Well, while he's doing this, I had injured my back, and I was home for a whole month, and I'm telling God, oh, look, I'm tired of being alone. Like, really? I have enough man uh, love, not just for a man, but a, for a family, too. Well, watch what you tell God, because he's hearing, and he's saying, I was waiting for that, and so that's why Ron writes this letter, and he sends it off. We didn't have emails there, so he actually mailed it, and he's hoping that I will read between the lines when I get the letter. Well... I get this letter, and he's telling me, yeah, he's widower and three kids. And I'm thinking, I'm wondering if he's fishing. And I'm thinking, nope, I'm not going to read between these lines. Hid the letter, hoped I would forget about it. But you know what? A month later, I have this dream about his wife. And she's in their kitchen. And she's wearing a white, beautiful gown. And she's just smiling. And she has a broom in her hand. And she's sweeping every corner. And I'm thinking, 
what is she doing? She should be up in heaven, you know, singing God's praises. And I asked her, Audrey, like, what are you doing here? Like, you should be up in heaven. And, and, uh, and she looks at me with a big, big smile. And she said, Anna, I'm making a place for you. Well, if you think the hairs on your arm went up, they still keep going up for me. <laughs> you know, it's just like, wow, I didn't sleep the rest of the night, and I thought, I better find that letter. I better answer it. And so in the morning, I thought, no, I'm not going to answer. I'm just going to call him. So I called him. He said, are you coming home for Christmas? Because he was now pastoring in Montreal, just 10 minutes from where my parents lived. And uh, I gave him the dates. He calls me the next morning after I had arrived. We went out the following night. It was a Thursday. Then Christmas was over the weekend. We went out Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. Thursday night I meet his parents and then he takes them home. We had gone out for dinner. He takes me back to my parents and then he decides to take off and he parks in the most unromantic place, throws up his hands in the air and he goes, Anna, I can't wait any longer. Will you marry me? I'm thinking, my goodness, this guy's in a rush. I mean, five dates, one week, like, and I haven't met the kids. And I looked at him and I said, uh, yes, yes, yes. Three times. Don't know why. Maybe the same reason he read that three times. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we had a whirlwind of a courtship. Um, he was flying to Toronto because I was pastoring in Toronto then and uh, one weekend and I would come back the next weekend and uh, yeah we were married in April before a crowd of 900 and uh, you know yeah, happily ever after no well not quite but almost uh, Psalms 147 says he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And he does do that. God does restore those years that the enemy, the canker worm, has taken away. And he gives you, grants you the desires of your heart. If you decide to stay true to him, faithful to him, and keep trusting him with the outcome of your situation. Amen? So storms are in the plan, but secondly, storms are under his control, and he does bring the peace. Then in verse 51, it says, he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down, and they were completely amazed. There was peace. So thirdly, storms usher in the peace of Jesus. His power was displayed, the storm was stilled, and the sea is now calm peace at last and the disciples are amazed well it was december of 89 24 uh, 27 years ago it'll almost be 27 i was now newly married just uh, eight months and i was also 20 weeks pregnant yeah that was a, a bit of a surprise <laughs> But uh, so I was looking forward to our first Christmas. We had decorated the tree, made the garland with the popcorn and the whole bed. And, and then I'm sitting there December 1st and my water breaks. And not being familiar with, you know, being pregnant, I waited until the next day to go to the hospital. So December 2nd, Ron drives me to the hospital and I'm examined by the doctor and he says, you're not going anywhere until you have this baby, either a miscarriage or you'll be here for the next 14 weeks, but you're staying in that bed until you have that baby. And I looked at Ron and I thought, I can't believe this is happening. Like, why, why do these trials have to come to us all the time? Like, you've had yours and I've had mine and now we have to have one together. It's like, couldn't this wait? But no, and so after he left, it was late. I was looking down out the window and I saw the Christmas lights below. And, and so I'm reminded of the reason for the season. And I begin to sing that song, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us, revealed in, in us. His name is called Emmanuel. And as I did, peace began to fill the room and my spirit. And, and I began to praise him. And I was experiencing God with us. Because Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he was right there. His presence was being felt in that hospital room. Well, I was in the hospital for over a month, and every day I sang this song to my unborn baby because I wanted her to know that Emmanuel was with us. And Tanya was born on January 1st, 
1990, she weighed one pound, six ounces, 610 grams, for those of you who are metric, 12 inches long. We were thrown into a world of beeping and buzzing and didn't know if she'd live or die. There's another picture. Um, yeah, see, th that's my finger. You see how tiny her fingers are? Like, really, she was just like a little doll that you buy for your grandkids. And then the family portrait, the next one. That was their first visit, and my little one, kept, Jeremy, kept saying, are we going to Tanya's house? He'd call the incubator Tanya's house. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, throughout that whole ordeal, I kept singing to her Emmanuel. I wanted her to know that Emmanuel is our source of strength, and no matter what came, she could count on God's presence being there. And, uh, well, God intervened. She... she Today is 26 years old. She's, I think, beautiful. Uh, she's gotten her master's in counseling and is on staff with us at the church and just a real blessing. And so God does come and perform the miraculous in your situations. Well, 24 years later, this September 25th, 2013, I'm diagnosed with breast cancer. And I'm in shock at what the doctor is saying. I felt like I was being handed a death sentence. Nobody wants to be told that they have cancer. And in my struggle to understand what was happening, the Lord kept reassuring me to, to be anxious for nothing and, and to bring my request to the Lord. And, you know, being anxious is only being human. I was being normal by being stressed, and, but I had to learn to give it to God. So I had the surgery in October, and uh, they told me it was a slow-growing one. It hadn't spread, but that I would need uh, 20 treatments of, of uh, radiation. December 2nd, 2013, Ron takes me to the hospital, and I'm going to begin radiation, and I'm distraught that morning thinking, oh, God, you know, I, is this going to hurt, and I don't know what I'm expecting, and I read my Bible that morning, but nothing stuck. Ever have those mornings when nothing seems to stick, and you go back, and you reread it, and reread it, and it still doesn't stick? So two days later, I thought, okay, let me go back, because, you know, sometimes we miss what God's trying to say, and I go back to December 2nd, and I, I read the verse for that day, and it's, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with a child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. I thought, how significant. You see, 24 years later, December 2nd, I was singing Emmanuel, that song, over and over again, every day for five months to my unborn child and then when she was born, like over and over again. And now only three times is that word used in the scripture. And God allows the writer of this journal to put that verse for December 2nd. That's how personal your God is, that he knows what it takes to grab your attention. Emmanuel, to me that meant he God, you're reminding me that you will once again be with me no matter what. So I knew that in the midst of this storm, I could count on him with his peace and strength and help that I needed. And I'm telling you, that's how personal our God is. Hebrews 13 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And how, how he was with us when Tanya was born, he was going to be with me on this cancer journey. God has says, so do not fear, in Isaiah 41.10, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you and uphold you with my righteous right hand. Emmanuel is here, right here today wanting to intervene in your situation, if you will allow him. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So don't let your hearts be troubled, and don't be afraid. That's what Jesus is saying to you in the midst of your storm. So in conclusion, and if the worship band will come back, storms are in the plan of Jesus. They come 
to everyone. They're unpredictable. They are impartial. But in the midst of the storm, you can count that Jesus is praying, Jesus is watching, and Jesus is waiting for that right moment to come into your situation and intervene. Secondly, storms are in under the control of Jesus. He comes at the right time and displays his miraculous powers. And thirdly, storms usher in his peace. Storms are always bigger than we are. But you know what? I know a God who is way bigger than any storm that I can face. And my God promises that he will always be there. He will not leave me. And he will bring intervention. He will calm the seas in that storm. Storms may come and go, but Jesus always remains. So, what do you do when you're in the midst of a storm and don't know where to go and what to do? You keep on rowing. You keep on rowing. The disciples rowed for over nine hours, and yes, they got tired. And yes, they must have been fearful. And yes, they must have cried out to God. But you know what? Jesus was watching, and he was praying, and he came at just the right moment and brought his peace to that storm. And he will do the same in your situation. Can we bow in a word of prayer?